Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, you will hear Youth Director Austin preach the topical sermon, The Gospel Feast, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now, to Austin. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. So if you pull it up on your phone or if you um, have an actual Bible, you can go ahead and open up there to Matthew chapter 22 and a passage that we've titled this morning, The Gospel Feast. Um, However, in my Bible and in uh, many people's Bible, it is titled The Parable of the Wedding Feast. And that's what it's commonly referred to as. Now, when I was preparing for this message uh, last week, and I was sharing this with First Service as well, I I did what any good scholar would do, and I took to Google (laughs) to find some answers. And I looked up various royal weddings because this deals with a royal wedding. And as I was looking those up, I found that um, one of the most extravagant weddings of the last decade actually took place this year. And it was in June of this year, and it was when the crown prince of Jordan got married to a wealthy and prominent woman from Saudi Arabia. And as you can imagine, crown prince of Jordan, wealthy, prominent woman from Saudi Arabia. This was a big time event. It was top notch. It was best of the best in every aspect as far as the reception, the food that was served, the entertainment, the vehicles that they drove in. I believe one of them was a custom made Range Rover. I mean, this stuff was top notch, okay? And royalty from all around the world attended this wedding. I saw that there were kings and queens and emperors. I didn't even know we had those anymore. (laughs) Princes, princesses from all over the world and the first lady of the United States as well. One website said about this wedding that it cost nearly $75 million. Okay, put that in your mind. That is astronomical, right? Now put this in your mind as well. I want you to imagine, put yourself in the position of not only being invited to this wedding, but also in the position to where you have the ability to attend this wedding. Because I don't know where it was held. I would assume Jordan. If I got an invitation, I can't get there. Okay. But I want you to put yourself in the position of you can be invited and you can attend. Okay. And not only that, not only are you going to get to dine with royalty and have the best of the best of everything, they're actually going to give you all the wedding gifts. Kind of weird, right? But if you attend the wedding, you will receive many valuable gifts yourself. And better yet, if you attend the wedding, you get to become a member of the family and you get to enjoy royalty forever. Okay? I want you to keep that in the back of your minds as we look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Starts off by saying this, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said. So we're going to stop there before we get into the actual parable. Because Roman numeral 1 in your bulletins, Jesus using parables. It's not the first time. We're told he spoke to them again by parables. And you don't have to go back too far. If you look at the end of Matthew 21, you will see the two stories recorded just prior to this were both parables. And depending on who you ask, because I found different numbers on this, there are around 35 to 39 parables spoken by Jesus in the New Testament. So it seems that parables were preferred by Jesus as his method of teaching. But why? Why parables? Now, understand there are multiple reasons for Jesus speaking in parables, and he gives us some of them. And the few that I'm going to give you this morning, it's not all encompassing. There are more reasons. But here are a couple that I think are very relevant, not only to this passage, but also to you specifically sitting in the room or listening online. There in your notes, here's one. Jesus used parables to illustrate a truth. A parable could be described as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. John MacArthur calls it a long analogy, so to speak, put into story form. 
You see, Jesus would take something that we can relate to, something that we understand, something that we are familiar with, like in today's passage, a wedding. Everyone in here is familiar with a wedding. But then he would apply a kingdom message to this story for us. Now, something else that I found interesting, and David Jeremiah said this, so to quote him, speaking of parables, he said, by teaching in parables... Jesus both illuminated the hearts of the spiritually sensitive and frustrated the minds of the spiritually blind. The same parable could be a blessing or a curse, depending on the mind of the person who was listening. And the same is true today. The greatest temptation we read, or sorry, the greatest temptation when we read the stories of Jesus is to read them as entertainment because there's so much more. So there in your notes, all of Jesus' parables were given to convey a valuable spiritual truth. Now I ask the question of why parables? And we're not alone in this. Perhaps you've asked that question. But guess what? The disciples asked it as well. They wanted to know why Jesus spoke in parables. And they asked this question of him in Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus responded in verse 11. And he said, because... It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. What's amazing about that is we see this in today's passage. As the religious leaders are told a powerful parable by Jesus, and it should have revealed a valuable spiritual truth to them, but their spiritual eyes have been blinded. In fact, if you leave our passage from this morning and go to the very next verse, it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Their spiritual eyes were blinded. So this morning, I want to pray before we get into the actual parable. So will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for your love. And we praise you. And God, I pray this morning that you would just reveal the truth to us from your words, God. Lord, that you would give us spiritual ears to hear and spiritual eyes to see, Lord, and spiritual hearts to understand. Lord, soften the hearts of everyone in here, myself included, Lord. Help us to just be focused and be ready to receive what you have for us. Reveal the truth to us, Lord. I ask this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So Roman numeral two, invitations declined. Look at verse two. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. And went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. We see the word like there. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. David Guzik said this when speaking of a wedding, and I think you'll agree with him, that a wedding was, back then, and often is today as well, the most significant social event of a person's life. And remember the story that I started off with, with that royal wedding. That was not an ordinary wedding, 75 million, right? This is not an ordinary wedding. Who is this wedding for? It's for the king's son. So who is arranging the wedding? The king himself. Guzik added this, the wedding of a prince would be a spectacular event. There in your notes, an invitation would normally be prized. But that's not what we see here. We see that the servants went out and invited the guests, but the guests were simply not willing to come. Now go back to that other wedding. 
if you received an invitation in the mail from the king of Jordan to his son's wedding and you declined it, do you think he'd send you another invitation? I don't think so. When I was writing this message, I thought about every wedding that I've ever been invited to. They only sent me one invitation. It didn't matter if I RSVP'd or whatever. They sent me one. After all, it's on me to accept the invitation, right? But the people decline the first invitation here. But here, the king sends out servants with a second invitation. This time, he even has the servants go into greater detail about the wedding ceremony and make it even more attractive than just the fact that you're going to a royal wedding. What does he end up saying? He says, see, I've prepared the dinner. My oxen, the fatted cattle, the best of the best. We're going to have ribeye steaks. Everything's ready right now. Come to the wedding. Yet in verse five, it tells us that they made light of it. They made light of the invitation. But I love how the NASB puts it there in your notes. They paid no attention. They simply paid no attention. They went their separate ways, one to his farm and another to his business. And these are the same people that declined the first invitation. They weren't willing to come. They declined this one. So it's invitations declined, plural. They seem to just be nonchalant or indifferent to the invitation itself. They go on back to their everyday life, never seeming to think of it. After all, why worry about going to the wedding when I've got my own stuff to handle or my own life to live? And perhaps the first invitation came and they just thought I'd respond to it, I'd accept it, but maybe later. The second one comes and the king says, now is the time. All things are ready. You must come to the wedding now. We don't have a refrigerator this stuff's going to go bad. It is time. Come to the wedding. And not only that, back then, an invitation from a king would not only have been considered an honor and a privilege to receive, like, wow, me? It would have also been viewed as a command, as a command to attend the wedding. But they're faced with the reality of having to make a decision. And what do they do? They just pay no attention. Now, maybe they think that they're not making a decision, kind of like me throwing an invitation on what we call the mail counter, probably to never be seen again. <laughs> maybe they think that we'll make the decision later. But here's the deal, to not make a decision, and please hear me on this, to not make a decision or to not pay attention to the invitation is to make a decision. You've made the decision to not attend the wedding. They're in your notes. They are indifferent to the invitation, just as some are indifferent to the call of the gospel. Now, where some are indifferent, there are others that are just all out against it. They're aggressive. They're antagonistic. They're unfriendly towards the servants who are simply trying to invite them to the wedding. And in fact, some, far, some will go so far in this that they become murderous. They seize the servants, they persecute them, and they kill them. And the king will have none of this. He sends out his armies, he destroys the murderers, and he burns up the city. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, because there's so much more to this. So there in your notes in Roman numeral three, who is everybody? Let's figure this out. Who's the king? Who is his son? Who are the servants sending out the invitations? And why would someone refuse. Well, the king is God. His son is Jesus. The invitation is the gospel. So the servants are the people sharing the gospel. But Israel declined the invitation. So verses one through eight definitely have a national emphasis here regarding Israel rejecting the gospel. But we also see this if we go to the Old Testament. We see prophets being sent to Israel time and time again, and they're treated spitefully. 
Oftentimes they were killed. But also in the Old Testament, we read that Israel would reject Jesus himself. In Isaiah 53, 3, we read this. He is despised and rejected by men. Speaking of Jesus, he is despised. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. In Psalm 118, verse 22, we read the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So fast forward to the New Testament. In a passage in the book of Acts, to give you a little bit of context before we go there, there's a passage that deals with Peter and John, and they've been arrested, treated spitefully, right? We're told that people laid hands on them and took them into custody. And I'm sure that entailed more when they took them into custody. They had healed a lame man and they were going about and they were preaching Jesus and preaching his resurrection and teaching the crowds about Jesus Christ. And like I said, they end up in jail and in custody and they're brought before the religious leaders and they're asked the question in verse seven, which won't be on the screen, but they're asked the question in verse seven of by what power or by what name did you heal this man? And here's how they respond. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Here it is. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That stone which the builders rejected that we read about in the book of Psalms, that stone is Jesus. And look who Peter's talking to here. He is speaking to the Jews. And what's crazy is if you keep reading in this passage, the religious leaders even recognize that Peter and John had been with Jesus. But they don't repent. They don't turn to Jesus. They reject him. Now, of course, in John 1.11, we read that he, being Jesus, came to his own. And his own did not receive him. But understand this. Salvation was first offered to the Jews. Paul puts it this way in Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For the Jew first, but also for the Greek. But I'll let you in on a little secret here. Jesus already knew all of this. He's speaking about it right here in this passage before it even happened. Warren Wiersbe says, speaking of this parable specifically, that the period described here must be after his resurrection and ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is speaking about Israel rejecting the gospel prior to him taking the cross, being buried, and being risen. He knows that they will deny, but in his grace, mercy, and patience, he sends more messengers with more invitations. He sends believers filled with the Holy Spirit to share the good news, to invite people to the wedding. Believers like Peter and John that we just read about. Believers like Stephen, who we read about also in the book of Acts. But what did they do to Stephen? In Acts 7, 57 and 58, we read this. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They killed Stephen. Remember? Many of the servants were treated spitefully and they were seized and they were killed. So they had rejected God, they had rejected His Son, and they had rejected the Holy Spirit. And we come to verse 7, and the king gets word of it. Not only that his invitations are being declined, 
but that they're killing the messengers. But look at verse 7. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. He'd have no part of it. And I believe that there's a dual fulfillment here because what Jesus is speaking about happened. But there's also more to come in the future. But Henry Ironside says this about this verse specifically. After Jesus had been rejected and crucified, God waited for some 40 years for Israel to repent, but they would not. God permitted the Roman armies to invade the land of Israel and destroy Jerusalem. And of course, this is speaking about the destruction of the temple around A.D. 70. And Jesus is talking about it before it happens. And Jesus himself, which was referenced in a passage from a few weeks back, also went on further to say in Matthew 24 too, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And remember, they completely destroyed the temple and burned it to the ground. But imagine this. Imagine you are now in the position of sending out an invitation. And you send out an invitation and a person declines. But you won't be deterred. You really want them at the wedding. So you send them another invitation. And now you get word that they've also declined that invitation. And they also killed the mailman who brought it. <laughs> Would you keep inviting that person to your wedding? I wouldn't. I don't want you there. That's kind of scary. You killed the mailman. But what does God do, right? Point four there in your notes. Will there be guests? Look at verse nine. It says, therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. There in your notes, like I said, Israel had rejected. So the gospel went out to the Gentiles. Here's what we read in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. When Paul is confronted with this issue, here's what we read. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. It's not what the sermon is about today, but I do want to be clear in the fact that God's not done with Israel. Okay? If you think God's done with Israel, go read Romans chapter 11 and so many other passages where God's not done. All right? But in God's foreknowledge, he did know that the Jews were going to reject the invitation. So the message went out to as many as the servants could find in verse 9. And I love that. If you look at it, it went out to as many. And they gathered together all whom they found. Not just some, not a few, not the best dressed, or just the men or just the women, or the rich or the poor, or a certain race or ethnicity. Ethnicity. No, it went out to as many as you find. Go tell everyone that the wedding hall is ready. The wedding is ready, both bad and good. And what do we read? The wedding hall was filled with guests. The fact is, is that God arranged this marriage for his son, Jesus. There's going to be guests at the wedding because it was for his joy. It was for his glory, not mine. And not to hurt your feelings, not for yours either. But the message went out again and again and again. And like I said earlier, yes, there was a national emphasis here regarding Israel and then the gospel being sent to the Gentiles. But there in your notes, there's also a personal application because you 
have to accept the gospel. You have to accept the invitation for yourself. And in this entire parable, we see God's grace because the truth is, is that none of us are worthy. Right? We read in verse 8 that the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Those were the people that were invited and they declined. But we're not truly worthy either. But there is one way to be worthy. Point five in your notes, the proper clothing. Look at verses 11 through 14. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. You see, back then, it was custom for the host of the wedding. So who's hosting this? The king. Okay, so it would be custom for the king to provide the wedding garment for the guest to wear. So everybody was properly attired. You didn't have to worry about going out and shopping for a dress or shopping for a tux. No, the king, it was custom for him to hand out the wedding garment, to have his servants to hand it out so that everybody at the wedding hall would be properly attired. And so this man comes to the wedding hall, but he doesn't accept the garment. And when I first read this, I thought... Perhaps this man came in just old, torn, tattered clothes, right? He just, he doesn't look the part. He sticks out. And I thought that's probably why the king knew to go and find him and say, hey, what, friend, why don't you have the wedding garment on? But I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's that he was in old, worn clothes. The more that I studied this passage, I gained a new perspective, which I want to offer you as well. I think this man is well-dressed. I think he's... He's looking sharp, dressed to a T. I think this is a brand new suit. I think he's got his shoes shined. He's got gold cufflinks. He's got his gold watch on, his tie, impeccable. He looks the part. And I envision him walking into the wedding. And I think about the servant stopping him. He's coming in and they say, oh, sir. Hey, here you go. Here's the king's wedding garment. He wants everybody to, to be properly attired today. And he says, I don't need that. No offense, guys, but I'm good to go on my own. I mean, come on. You, you don't see this? This is like $1,500. Look at this watch. I'm good. I don't need the king's wedding garment. So he chose to attend the wedding in his own clothes. And he offered those explanations perhaps to the servants. We don't read that here. This is me just thinking a little bit outside the box here as to why he did not need the wedding garment. I'm well dressed, brand new suit. I'm good to go on my own. But notice what he says to the king when the king comes in and says, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? What does he say? Nothing. Nothing. He was speechless speechless before the king. He had all these reasons, or I can imagine that he had all these reasons as to why he didn't accept it. But when confronted by the king in his majesty, glory, and splendor, he quickly realized, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. And there's a huge picture here that I pray that you're following. Because listen to what we read from Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all, not some of us, we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Our own clothing, filthy rags. Henry Ironside said this about this man, that is a big danger for all time. He's like many who say today, I do not think I am so bad. I do not need a savior. I am good enough as I am. You thought you weren't so bad. You're not, I've never killed anybody, right? I'm not a bad person. 
Maybe I've told a lie here and there, but I do a lot of good works. I give a lot of money to charity. I tithe. I grew up in a Christian home. My mom was a Christian. I've been in church my whole life. Maybe you were even baptized. But to trust in our own clothing as this man did is to trust in our own righteousness. And if you're here today in your own clothing without a wedding garment, it just doesn't work. Trying to stand before a perfect, holy God in our own righteousness, it's not going to work. You'll be left speechless as you realize that you're not worthy. So what is the wedding garment? How do I get it? Well, here's what we read in Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. There in your notes, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Here's the wedding garment. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. God in his grace and mercy, he continues to send out invitation after invitation after invitation after invitation to the wedding. And what is the wedding? The wedding is a picture of believers placing their faith in Jesus Christ and accepting his free gift of salvation. It's the gospel feast. It's the great exchange that if you've ever been here before, you had to have heard Rich say it. The great exchange found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, being God, made him being Jesus, okay? He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I get to be righteous and Jesus took all my sin? That should be mind-blowing to you. I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself here, but I think about my life, and I get to be righteous? And Jesus took all my sin? Wow. This is so that we might be clothed in the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness, through faith in Jesus, put on the wedding garment, because it's been revealed to us that we can't go to the gospel feast in our own clothes. And there's coming a time, and I don't know when it is, but there is coming a time when it'll be too late to change clothes. And you'll be asked the question, friend, how did you get in here without the wedding garment? It was too late for this man. The king didn't say, hey, go back out to the front door and get the wedding garment, silly. Didn't say that, did he? No. It says, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. Forever away from the king's presence. In eternal misery. You see, many are called, but few are chosen. And remember what I said about verse 8 and the fact that those who were invited were not worthy. Well, neither was I. And again, to not hurt your feelings, neither were you. And neither are you. What can a sinful man do to be worthy in the eyes of a holy God? It's all about him. You have to recognize your need for a savior, repent of your sins, and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because many are called, but few are chosen. So did I choose God or did God choose me? Right? The great theological debate. Yes. How about that? Because what do you have to do to be a chosen one? If you're sitting there wondering, how can I be a chosen one? Answer the call. Respond and place your faith and trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'd be a chosen one. You see, this verse deals with the cooperation of the choosing of God and the choices of man. But all have the opportunity to accept the wedding garment. But you have to accept it for yourself. You can't have my wedding garment. And today you have that opportunity to put on the wedding garment. The opportunity to accept Jesus. And there's coming a time when it's too late to accept the invitation. And notice throughout this parable, it doesn't matter whether you're indifferent to the gospel, antagonistic, aggressive, 
and probably not anybody in here, but maybe somebody online, I don't know, or maybe in your heart that you've murdered the messenger, or maybe you're just unchanged by the gospel like this man was, but regardless of all of that, they all end up with the same fate. They do not attend the gospel feast. If it's, hmm, maybe later. Or if it's, get away from me, I don't want to talk about that. Or if it's to the person that's murdered them, they all have the same fate. They won't be in heaven. But the gospel feast is not only just off in the great by and by someday. It's right now. It's here and now. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and enjoy the feast. You get to come. You get to get the gifts. Love, joy, peace. Abundant life. Here and now. But here's the deal. You cannot have the then and there of heaven, the marriage supper with the Lamb, unless you have the here and now. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And yes, there's an application here for believers in the room as well. Notice that these servants or these messengers, they went out and they go out the first time and the people decline it and they're just not willing to come. The people refused, but the servants went out again and the people refused. And not only that, they also seized them and treated them spitefully and even killed some of them. But the servants went out again and the wedding hall was full. The message to the believer in the room is go out and share the good news. What do you care more about? Just huh, living your life and knowing that, well, I'm good. Or do you care about the fact that your coworkers may not be good to go or that your loved ones may not be good to go? You know the people in your life that need to hear the good news. You see, God is almighty and he's sovereign. We don't know when we share the gospel who is going to receive Jesus and who is not. But the fact is, is we've been told by the king to go out and tell people about him. We should just simply be obedient and leave the results up to God. And it's so freeing to know that I don't have to argue someone into heaven. That I don't have to sit there and spend all of eternity just speaking to you, trying to get you to believe I have loved ones and, and, and family members that I've tried to do that with. It doesn't work. Be obedient. Leave the results up to God. He's in charge. Pray for these people. Share the gospel and pray while you're sharing the gospel and then continue to pray for them that the Holy Spirit would get after them. But think about that story that I started with. Imagine that you were invited to a royal wedding and you're in the position to attend. And by attending, you are going to be the one that receives these many gifts. You even get to become a member of the family and enjoy this abundant life and be royalty forever. Why would you decline such an invitation? Today, you're invited. You're invited to the gospel feast, and there's no logical reason to decline. So if you haven't been paying attention for the last 30 minutes, just focus real quick. And pay attention to this. What about you? Make this entire parable. I said there's a national emphasis here, and there is. But what about you? Make this entire parable personal. Have you heard the gospel? And you were just, hmm, I'm good. Maybe you've heard it and you were super against it. And you were aggressive to the person sharing it. I don't know. I've seen that. Make it about you. Today, God sends out another invitation to you personally to receive the gospel. Maybe you've never heard it. What is the gospel? When short, in a nutshell, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read that the gospel is the fact that Jesus came and that he died for our sins, that he was buried for our sins, and that he rose on the third day. We serve a risen Savior. Jesus is alive. So then the question is, and this is how we'll end, there are point six in your notes, is will you be there? Henry Ironside said this, when sinners come in repentance, trusting in Christ, 
Then he clothed them with the garment of salvation, with the robe of righteousness. This is the wedding garment that makes one presentable at the marriage supper. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And like every week, there are people all throughout the chapel in the back that want to pray with you. Not only are they willing to pray with you, they want to pray with you. If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. A time is coming, and again, I don't know when it is for you, but a time is coming when you cannot change clothes, and it's too late to accept the invitation. Why put it off? There's no logical reason. If God is speaking to you, if he's tugging at your heart, respond to him. And you can be one of the chosen. That's as simple as that. So come, please pray with us. Regardless of what's going on, what your needs are, our ultimate need for all of us is Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to Youth Director Austin preach the topical sermon, The Gospel Feast, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Tune in next week as Pastor Rich preaches the sermon, A Shepherd's Perspective on Christmas. Join us every Sunday morning, either in person at 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. or online at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Simply click on the resources tab and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.